Buprenorphine naloxone, or also called Suboxone, is what's called a partial agonist, and it's designed to specifically treat opiate dependence. It helps with withdrawal symptoms, it helps with cravings, and it helps to block the high people get from heroin or pain pills. Um, by a partial agonist, it means it does not have the full agonist activity um, that, say, heroin or pain pills um, have that ca can cause sleepiness, people feeling out of it, the potential for overdose. It just basically helps with the withdrawal symptoms so people could feel normal and then has that blocking effect. I started using opiates about four years ago recreationally. Um, and it progressed into um, an addiction. Trying to find help was, was difficult. Um, I knew nothing about it. I knew no one who was going through the situation. So we called several clinics, you know, in-house in, in treatments, stuff like that. And that just really wasn't gonna work for her. I mean, you have to know your child and know what kind of treatment is best for them. So she wanted to help you know, desperately too. So she got on the internet and researched everything. And Jordan is actually the one who told me about the Suboxone. The first thing I do when a person comes in is I try to identify the problem that they have. You know, um, first of all, look at all the, do a screening for all the drugs that they're, that they're taking. Um, and uh, for instance, if people are taking uh, both benzodiazepines, um, such as Clonopin or Xanax or alcohol, and opiates, they would not be, in my, in my mind, a good candidate for Suboxone because there is dangers of mixing those two medications, mixing the Suboxone with benzodiazepines or alcohol. So the first thing I'm doing is seeing what drugs they have problems with. Um, in order to evaluate for Suboxone, I want to make sure that they're indeed opiate dependent, which means that um, they developed a high tolerance to opiates and if you would withdraw the opiates, they would have withdrawal symptoms. One day, one of Mike's friends came over when he wasn't home and said, I need to talk to you about some things that's going on in Mike's life. And uh, we went in the house, and he proceeded to tell me that um, he had caught Michael with a syringe and realized that he had a heroin problem and he needed help. We confronted him, and uh, he agreed that he needed help, but he wanted to pick the treatment himself. That was his only specification. We said, okay, here's the phone, make some phone calls. And he was a little reluctant at first, but we weren't going to back down. And he finally made the phone calls and set up the initial appointment. I hadn't really tried any other method of treatment other than just trying to detox by myself. Um, that hadn't worked, you know, I just relapsed, went right back to it. Um, I had heard of Suboxone. I knew of methadone as well, but the daily visits just weren't going to work for me. When people start taking Suboxone, when we do that first induction, they usually say, I feel normal. I have not felt normal in years. I actually feel normal. Do they feel high? No. They don't say it high. Now they might, some of them do say, I feel a little bit of a surge in energy. And that's most likely because they've just come out of withdrawal, which is a lot of fatigue. So now they've had some energy, but they don't, they don't appear out of it. I mean, if you were to line 100 people up and look at them and say, you know, could you guess who's on Suboxone? No. Sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I, I have the, I wouldn't say withdrawal, but I would say, um, uneasy feelings, but after I take the Suboxone, it really normalizes me, makes it so that I can just do everything that I need to do in the day. We did observe a change in, in Michael. Um, he's really uh, an intelligent individual. You know, before there was an unwillingness to, to communicate or be part of the, uh, the family group. I think uh, taking the, uh, the medication um, helped bring him back into into our uh, family. When you're on a medication like Suboxone, I feel it's essential to have that supportive person to actually hold on to the medication, make sure that the, the patient's actually taking it correctly. Dr. Hurst said, you know, the family all had to be involved and I had to give Jordan her medicine for one thing. Jordan had to live at home. I was in possession of the medicine. If I was gonna be gone, my husband or anyone could give it to her every morning, I, you know, when she needed it. You know, she couldn't have the phone, cut off her phone, cut off her money. He said there's three rules that you need to have. No phone, no car or transportation, and no money. As soon as I walked out, I said, I don't like him. I was already so mad that I 
I knew I was just going to have to be at home all the time. My mom was going to be right there nagging me, which is what I thought at the time. She was just doing it because she cares, and I'm glad that she's there. But just him to tell me this and to tell me I can't talk to my friends and the boyfriend that I had, he said I needed to get rid of him. I definitely had to change my network of friends. Uh, the old friends were gone just because they they thought I was still part of their lifestyle and I wasn't, I couldn't live that way. So I did what I had to be done. I deleted most of their numbers and deleted all my drug dealers numbers. I didn't need them anymore. Every morning I would get up and give him his tablets at that time and watch him take them. And at some point I started trusting him to do it, which probably isn't a really good idea. So we went back to Every morning I dispense his medications. I had relapsed one time. Uh, it was over a course of two months. There was a point, a small point in time where um, I would have the Suboxone just left out until we realized that there was a problem and that wasn't working. Sometimes he would go into work late and he wouldn't be up when I would leave for work, so I would leave the medication one dose out for him and usually I'd come home later and find the wrapper in the trash, and hopefully that meant he took it. But I wasn't always able to be there when he was to take the medication. I kind of worked my way into rights. That was a right, and it's gone. I take my Suboxone from my parents every morning. Typically, following the initial induction, people will see us in a week for monitoring. And, and at each session, the way we do things is we have people see a counselor. I have two um, licensed chemical dependency counselors that work with me. Typically they'll see that counselor and then they'll see me. Um, and we basically check in with them. We see how the medication's doing. We see if they've made environmental changes in their life. They're getting rid of the drug dealers. They're getting rid of the, you know, the, the drug addict friends. We try and make sure people are keeping busy, that, they're, you know, that they have a job um, or they're heading towards school, that they often have goals. Maybe they're a full-time parent, that they're able to parent, and those sort of things. So we're checking in on their functioning as well. Typically, if that first appointment goes well and their urine looks good, um, and we talk to family members, everything's going good. We'll often space it out monthly after that. When it comes to treating addiction, I think you need a team. And that's why I get family members involved. Um, I think medication's one part of the team. Um, individual counseling, peer support, AANA. They, I don't think people can do it themselves. And I think trying to convince someone that they could do it themselves, they develop this addiction because they don't have control. I think one thing I've realized in this whole, whole thing is that no medication is, is going to be the key. It's, it's going to be a combination of uh, the right uh, treatment by medication, the right counseling, and uh, the right social group to, to share experiences with. And, and uh, he has been to some, and, and we have been to some also. I think for me personally, the NA helps out just because it's easy to relate to a lot of people. They all have the same story. Of you know, sobriety and actively trying to stay clean. Uh, their advice is just so wise and they're very well spoken. Uh, just about anything they can say, you can at least point out and be like, hey, I, you know, I've been there, I've done that. And uh, with that, you also have this whole support network of people that want to help keep you clean, which is absolutely amazing to me. I did share with some of my coworkers and I was amazed to find out how many of them had a family member that had also had an addiction. I mean, almost anyone I shared it with said, you know, I have a cousin, a brother, a mother, a father. It is reassuring to, to talk to other people that have um, similar problems in their life. And I've also started going to a Naranon meeting. It's for the families of addicts and it's very helpful to share ideas with them and learn things that they've went through and solutions they've found that have helped them cope with their loved one's addictions. Mostly NA is pure abstinence from drugs in general. I don't know how they feel about Suboxone, but you know, I take the advice and that's what matters to me personally. When you're using drugs, um, such as heroin or pain pills, you're riding the chemical highway and you're driving in a Porsche and you're driving erratically and you're driving miles and miles down this chemical highway. And while you're driving down the chemical highway, you're making a lot of changes to the brain, okay? So your brain, after you've traveled 
months, years down this chemical highway is very different. Now your brain's reliant on opiates and actually has a reduced number of opiate receptors and lots of other changes that basically, you know, are involved in this disease of addiction. And so the way I see it is you have to travel back and you're not going to travel back overnight. And the metaphor I like to compare Suboxone to is your minivan. You're getting out of your Porsche, which is driving erratically, but it's caused you all sorts of problems. You're driving safely. You're driving safely back, and that takes time. It's not going to happen. You were doing this for months or years, driving down this chemical highway, changing your brain, and the way I see it is you've got to head back slowly. You've got to head back, and it could take months or even years to kind of get back where you started.